right, I guess we'll call this uh, Assembly Ethics and Elections Committee meeting to order. It's May 23rd, 2018, at a little of about three or four minutes after noon. <coughs> and I guess we'll do uh, introductions. I'm Pete Peterson. Forrest Dunbar. Carolyn Hill. Dean Gates, Assembly Council. Ann Dawson, interpreter. Barbara Jones, municipal clerk. Amy Silver, clerk's office. Gina Asher, interpreter. And Mr. Croft is on his cell phone right now, and he'll be joining us momentarily. So, let's go to new business, and we'll talk about electing the Board of Supervisors and the limited road service area, and what ideas we have to maybe make that somewhat easier. So, um, Mr. Chair, it is my opinion that you have two section of, sections of the code that um, the clerk's office implemented in the election that I think caused some confusion for voters. And the one is that we're required to have a write-in on every um, race. So every race, race, it's required to have a blank for a write-in. So that is one provision of the code that we implemented. The second provision of the code that we implemented is the requirement in the code that LURSA candidates declare as a write-in five days before the election. And um, this provision, I would like to let you know, is an important provision. And the reason it was put in is that there are 23, approximately 23 LURSA uh, boards that are up for election each year. And this year I think there were only about 13 declared candidates, including five that actually declared as a write-in. So at the end of the filing for office period, there were only eight, eight out of 23 people declared for those seats. So what that means for the clerk's office and what it's meant in the past is that after the election is over, we pull all of the ballots, and if you want to go into the, um, the vault and look, most of the ballots, the, there were more ballots cast in Assembly District 6 than any other district, and you hand count the write-ins. So you have to go through every single ballot, and then you have a tally, and you tally them. What happened after we tallied them was that um, Amy Solberg got two votes and Dean Gates got two votes, and so it would be a coin toss. But um, we don't have any way of contacting Amy Solberg or Dean Gates because we don't know them. They never filed for office. Public Works doesn't know who they are. So then we Google them and we contact Amy and she laughs at us and said, my neighbors did that as a joke. And we'll call Dean or we'll never get a hold of Dean. So in the past, those LURSA candidates, those positions, those oaths of office were not done until sometimes in July. And sometimes those people never wanted to serve. So. Um, when Jennifer Johnston and Bill Evans were on the assembly, we asked if we could make the LURSA positions appointed. And um, we held a meeting with the um, assembly members, and Bill Falsey was the municipal attorney and actually had drafted an ordinance to that effect. Um, Maury Robinson was supportive of it and thought the LURSA folks would be supportive. We bought pizza and we held the meeting, they were not supportive. They did not want to be appointed. So in, instead, the state requires um, candidates, writing candidates to declare five days ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And that was the alternative that the assembly proposed and approved. Mm -hmm. So there is a conflict here now between these two provisions of the code. We have to have a write-in, but the LURSAs have to be declared. Um, we would, we could have some information on a ballot that would say, for the LURSAs, you must be declared. 
I will tell you that we could not have done that this election because there was no space. Yeah. In, in fact, our vendor had to fudge on all of the ballots to make sure that we could get them to fit on this, um, the 18 inch ballot. So if we ever had a ballot this size again, so I'm asking you, I think we can make a code change that says that on LURSA races, the clerk will include some information that says that write-ins need to be declared um, five days in advance. But I want to not make it mandatory and I want you to allow us some flexibility whether we put that in the instructions or with the race or at the bottom of the ballot or maybe in a separate document. Maybe I, it would be easier for me to just do a mailing to everyone in you know, District 6 than it would be to have to go to a two-page ballot. So that's kind of the issues that you're facing with the LURSA candidates. Mr. Dunbar? So I, I have a couple of questions, and, and uh, you know, a lot of this is the byproduct of the fact that we are basically, how I describe this exactly, we have this unique creature down on the hillside and other places, the LURSA, and we are being forced essentially, well, I don't want to even say it that way, but we are, we're, we're basically subsidizing. They're supposed to be kind of self-supporting. They, they raise their own funds, they do their own operations, and we're kind of subsidizing them because it is difficult to run this process for them. Um, and so I guess my two questions are, one, why has it... Explain to me why it was a bigger deal, or was it a bigger deal during the write-in, or I mean, during the vote by mail, than it was during poll-based election, or could we have gotten the same complaint that we did under poll bases? Or do you see any major difference between the two on this, with this thing? No difference. That ordinance right. was passed in 2016, and we had no complaints in 16 or 17. But is there something I'm trying to think like logistically? Is there something that? would be different about the vote by mail experience that would lead people to believe that their write-ins didn't have to be declared? Or no. we got an unusual amount of write-ins. I'm trying to remember the, the specific complaint we got was that there was a bunch of write-ins for a particular person and that that person did not win. Well, no one knows that because we didn't count them. Right. Um, but a write-in campaign was waged for a certain person, and the person that won did only have 13 votes. So it's remotely possible that the other person could have won. But, but they I didn't don't declare. Know the answer to that, right? Um, in the alternative, like let, let's say that we do decide to change it back in some way to make it permissive. Is there some way to charge the Lursas for your time? Um, did you know that was one of the original proposals that we had? And the answer to that was, yes, you may charge the LURSAs, but then you have to charge the fire service area, hmm. you have to charge ARTSA, you have to have ch charge 2 VAC fire, and all of the service areas. Gotcha. Because they, uh, because in theory, someone could win an unregistered writing campaign at in any district, and you'd have the same problem. Well, I, yes, but ARDSA has a bond on the ballot yeah. that takes up space and oh, takes gotcha. up time. So if you're charging that service, if you're going to charge the LURSA service areas, you have to charge the ARDSA. But the bond doesn't require area. you to go Google someone's name and then try to hunt down a hunt down some and then be told no, it's Mickey Mouse. Not that me. is true. The extra work involves the the LURSAs, just the races. So, thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Have, have we, other than that meeting that you mentioned, have, have we tried to educate the LURSA boards and so that they know that they have to file or remind them or something? Uh, it's uh, somewhat changed from the old days. So. Do you know, Mr. Chair, I believe that they were notified at the time that that happened. And then we communicate with Maury and um, it used to be Therese. And 
I we sent multiple emails to them. The filing for office period is the same as it is for you as elected officials. And yes, we send the information to them. We ask them to get it out to both the LURSA boards and their communities. So all of that information is out there and those people know they have those two weeks to file. Um, Amanda would usually send her a notice and say, hey, I've only got eight people that have filed out of 28 seats. Do you want to send out a reminder? So um, those reminders were sent. I, I do not believe that any reminder has specifically been sent that said you have to have a five day for a write-in. I don't think that reminder was sent. Well, I, I, I think that might be something we should consider and try next year. Because if we haven't tried that, maybe that would, if we could get to at least 50 percent <laughs> of, of the verses that had a declared candidate or two, it would be much better than what we did this year. Um, yeah, I was trying to remember, but it's, is it the uh, published notice of the election? A note uh, or some lines in there that says why the candidates have to declare. You are it's correct. Yes, that is correct. So we published the notice of election and Dean edited it for me and remembered correctly that there is a notice that says you have to, there's a five day period for a declared writing. Mr. Dunbar. I, I mean, I think that the clerk has articulated why we have the process we have. Um, we received a, you know, a complaint and some testimony that was pretty passionate. It happens to be a, a quirk of this of this committee that we don't have any mem we don't have any lurses in any of our districts unless you have one, Chris or Eric. Oh, right, we have uh, we have stuck again, but they they are way on top of this kind of stuff. So that's not an issue with stuck again. Stuck again's whole society is built around one road, um, so they're very much on top of it. But. Um, I would propose that we not take further action on this and allow one of our colleagues from South Anchorage to, if they were to so choose, propose an ordinance or a resolution that could come back before this committee. Okay. That's just my suggestion. And I, I just happened to think of a question. Uh, are um, terms on worship boards, are they one year, three years, two years, three years? Okay. Well, I thought maybe if. And, and there are, and they and they stagger the terms so someone's up there all the time, right? Okay. Maybe we should make them like eight-year terms. <laughs> then, then nobody'd ever run. But, uh, <laughs> I, I will let you know, um, Mr. Chair and other members, that we at the same time we also change the code so that if there's a vacancy on Alursa, the mayor appoints and the assembly approves. So previously, it would be as if there was a if there was a vacancy on Alursa, there would be two seats open on um, the ballot. Well, again, if that would have happened this year, we would have been forced to go to a two-page ballot. So we ended that because people quit in the middle of those sure. terms. You bet. And again, it's it you shouldn't be dealing with those and adding to the adding to the cost of the election um, for things that can be handled administratively, I think. All right. Any any other comments or questions about uh, the limited road service area candidates and elections? Any ideas? Okay. Let's, let's go down to additional proposed code changes. Is this be is this Dean that's going to be presenting this? A little bit. Uh, I didn't come prepared to present about any proposed code change, but uh, more to report, I guess. Uh, I should have written a few and any copies if you want to get what we all know that says I think that uh, providing the posted stamps is a little bit of a little bit of a little bit so, uh, this seems sort of counterintuitive and ridiculous for the answers. Did you choose that much? So, the comedy asked me last month to uh, ask the Attorney General's office about the Supreme 
Return postage. Um, or do we have anything new on that? Return postage. I I think that may have been a typo on our part, Dean. Yeah. I okay. Was going to talk about postage. Right. I didn't stand for the voters. <laughs> oh no, that's a typo. Okay. So, Mr. Chair. Right. As to the return postage, I think you all understand the dilemma, and I think um, we may um, learn some things in the next um, six months that might help us with this, but we do need to make a decision within probably about five months because it involves a redesign of our envelope, it involves the uh, business reply mail has to have post office approval. Um, so, and then purchasing new envelopes. So the, the question for the assembly is this, is do you want to change the rule regarding the receive by date? And that might be something we could um, practice in a mock election or something to that effect. Or because the received date is going to be a big change for voters that ballots have to be received by a certain date versus postmarked by a certain date. Um, so we can we can experiment with that. And um, but but that's your decision. Okay. No comments or questions about that? Okay. Um. Mr. Chair, let me make another um, offer. I will offer that in the next couple of weeks, we'll go ahead and get started on a redesign of envelopes. And we'll get a proposal worked up with our, our envelope printer and get approval with the post office. And then that way next fall, if you're ready to make a decision, we can just pull the trigger on the envelope design. Look, oh, I, I thought we already had a, a bunch of envelopes purchased that would be available for use next year. Mr. Chair, you are correct. We have um, about 500,000 envelopes for use next year. 500,000? Holy cow. Sounds like a half a million. 
Well, well, no, no. I purchased five hundred thousand this year, so that's two fifty and two fifty. So I've got okay. about two hundred fifty thousand. Okay, yeah. only a quarter million. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, quarter million. <laughs> well, we could. I mean, we could. If we did the change, we could do it like in twenty twenty. We could maybe use use all of our. Yeah, I think that might be a wise choice. Okay. Right. Or, or, or. Uh, do you want to go ahead? I wanted to ask just a rough number, Barbara. Do you remember how many ballots we received on Thursday and Friday of the week of the election? It was in the hundreds or dozens? Um, you know, it was, I think the, the biggest number that actually surprised us was the Wednesday, the sure. day after the election. We had 10 trays, which was over 2,000. Uh -huh. And then the next couple of days were lower. They were like in the hundreds. But Which then day was the day? Wednesday. Uh, the day yeah. after. No, April 4th. Right. The day after the election was, um, it was like one tray less than election day. So, and then um, <coughs> the next week we got a big, a big bunch again on Monday, like another, I know we were kind of surprised huh. about that. But it was another um, thousand or so um, oh, unfortunate. On, on like Monday. So it must have been all the people in the lower 48 that mailed on election day. It took those until about Monday. To and get and those, uh, those were all postmarked, right? Right. So if we were to realistically set it out to like a Friday or whatever, all those would have been invalid. If we had set a cutoff date is what I mean. Yeah, but the next Monday was when they got that thousand in, and those then would would have been past the Friday date, so they wouldn't have been counted. There. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying if we if we go to business reply, people are going to have to learn to mail their stuff earlier, or, or at least we just thousand. extend it out and say received within a week, right? We, we have we have a longer date. The, yeah, I guess that's true, although they have to be get on and have some kind of, do they need any kind of preparation before they go to the, on that Friday, they, or 10 days after, they have to go before the election commission, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any prep work? Is there, how much lead time does it take to get everything ready for the election commission? Well, we were, pro we picked up mail like three times on the 13th, so everything we picked up on the 13th got to the election commission. So, you know, it's. You know, it's a lot on election day, but by the 13th, we can manage, you know, 20 or 30. So it's a little prep, but not a lot. So in, in Eric's scenario, for example, we just do business reply mail. We set a, a week from election day is the deadline, and if you don't get your ballot in by then, it's invalid. And then you have, there's three days before between that and is that enough time to get everything ready for the election commission? Because it should... Well, if it's the same pattern. It was a spikier pattern than we thought, right? Yeah. It was, we were trailing with like, oh, no, it's going to be nobody. And then it's, oh, when we were on that curve up, yeah. it's going to be huge. And then it, it spiked right down. But you're saying there was another Monday spike of, of overseas. Right? Well, let's say a bump. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, I, I, I mean, it's almost a, a policy call, right? They can accommodate it. How important do we think it is? And it, there'll be a little bit of confusion or frustration when you say, well, we're just cutting off a week, so, and it's business reply. Um, you, you know, you better do it early enough from wherever you are that it's likely to get there. That's just our, our kind of, did, did you say that um, King County does it that way? Which, which big jurisdiction does a, just a hard cut off instead of a post -cut? You know, I'd have to check. Somebody. Right. I'd have to check on that. You know, the flip side of that is those 600 we got rid of, or maybe it was 300 of the 600 that weren't postmarked in time, those would have counted. <laughs> right. If you make it in, yeah, you make it, it in. 634 right. or whatever it was, yeah. How, how worried are we about people who vote based on information on this? So, so that, that would be the problem, is that you'd be publishing results on Tuesday and if you're talking about receive, then mm -hmm. people could vote. Throw in the ballot. Throw in the yep. post office. Right. They'd know what the results were. Did They'd have to have their ballot and save their ballot. Why mm -hmm. is that a problem? 
Well, I think, you know, we would need to talk to, I'd need to get an opinion from like election gurus, you know, nationwide. Um, I think you know John Lindbeck, is that correct? Oh, John Lindbeck? Lindbeck. Yeah. Lindbeck. Okay. John Lindbeck was concerned that our polls closed at 8 and that we were going to publish results before midnight when people could postmark their ballots. He was concerned that that tiny window there would cause some type of fraud. So, but fraud? Yes, or a, you know, people trying to manipulate the vote. So, I would just like to ask an opinion from someone like him who has different experience than I do. Well, I could certainly see a potential for uh, I don't know if it's fraud or exactly what what you would call it to be, but if someone looked up at the results and saw they were trailing by 20 votes or whatever, and they had till Friday to try to make that up, they'd be on the phone calling everybody they know to call everybody they knew to make sure everybody voted. So they might be able to sort of manipulate the election after the fact if it was close. Is that, yeah, I mean, I guess that's true, but is that the worst thing in the world, that people are more motivated to vote? I, I don't know if that's the worst thing in the world or not. It's just something that might be totally different. I think you know? it's motivated to vote because they know what the results are. Right. I think I think we want to motivate people to vote, but not because they know what the results are. So we delay the results, maybe? I don't know. That would be okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we could... Uh, we could I, do that. I, I don't know. I think people would, if you delayed the results... I think people would think there was something fishy going on because they're so used to getting results on election night. I mean, switching that, I think, would... No, don't know for sure, but I, I think we'd get a lot of pushback on that. And because we, we'd, pu we'd pull down the, the next day, we'd close and pull that pull out, or I guess we just close the drop boxes, right? So drop boxes wouldn't be available. The accessible vote centers wouldn't be available. So... In effect, there still is like an election day on that Tuesday, right? I mean, because if we expect a lot of our uh, ballots to come in that way, so we'd still have the vast majority. Like the the vast majority of votes would be in, or a good chunk of them would be in by Wednesday, say, you know, that following Wednesday. Well, these are great discussions, and uh, I think we'll have to continue them because we okay. have a rather long agenda today, and we're about a, down to less than half an hour. So um, let's go to the challenges or allegations of fraud on our agenda. Speaking of which, we've been joined by Mr. Cotts. Oh, that's right, Mr. Cotts. <laughs> <laughs> there are no allegations of fraud here. Um, I reported to you in the AM about the one challenge that we had, and you know I also reported to you about the four voters or so that voted twice, and I don't have anything to add to that unless you have some additional questions. So, of the ones that uh, we are aware of, do we think it was an accident that they voted by uh, twice, or do we think they were attempting fraud? Well, I think that the the record shows that a father voted for a son, and they have the same name and the same address. And um, I think when the father first voted the ballot, it could have been an accident, but then the father voted the second ballot and probably should have notified us. So I, I don't think that appeared to be an accident. In the other example, a father voted for his daughter, and he did call us and say, hey, I voted for my daughter. Can you void her ballot? And we tried to contact the daughter <clears throat> and were unsuccessful, and the commission voted to void that ballot. So the one, I think, is still problematic. Um, the other ones... Um, where I think people voted other people's ballots except for the father-son example. I think they were accidents. And um, the challenge amounted to we were able to resolve the challenge. The person never voted. So, so we had three or four potential challenges of 
maybe fraud out of you know, 80,000 votes, that's a pretty small percentage. It's lots of zeros before you get to a number. So, um, oh, yeah. You're about to move on? We're, yeah. Or do you have additional questions? So do you, do you, is it you who makes the decision whether to refer anything to the prosecution? That is a very interesting issue, and I'm glad you asked that. Um, when we were talking about this with um, Becky and Dean, Becky, Becky's position is that when there's an allegation of fraud, it's a crime, it must be immediately referred to APD, and APD must investigate. And I said, well, if I don't do some type of initial investigation, what is APD going to do? And so we agreed that there probably needs to be a small code change that indicates that the clerk's office or the clerk does a preliminary investigation in, and we thought it should be in conjunction with the municipal attorney. So I have some um, legal advice and some independence. And, um, and especially since you are, it could possibly be in one of your elections. So we thought that would be good to have um, the municipal attorney advising me. And then um, we would make a decision together or somehow we would follow like the petition process or some other process and then make a decision to refer that to APD. It does make sense that you have the information. I mean, APD officer would necessarily know how to start with, you have the dates and the things and what was sent and what was received. And the two ones that you mentioned, those are, those are sort of the worst. One that's self-reported and then the other that it's just not kind of not clear whether it's coming for the sun, but was that confusion or was that intent? Well, yes, exactly. We have no idea what intent was there. Thank you. And sometimes it's hard to prove intent. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. so. I think outside of the clerk's review process, you have to someone who's alleging fraud and public consensus. Talk to MPD, that's right. They can get you through. We, we could refer them directly to APD. I think that that, I, I think that we, um, we may, I, I'm okay with that, but I think that um, I'm concerned about APD's resources, that this is really important to me, and I think that, you know, we have the data and we can look it up. We don't want to have any fraud, and so I would be okay if, um, complaints or allegations of fraud came to me or APD or the municipal attorney. I would be open to them coming in, in your code rewrite. Okay. And we've discussed doing that. We have a meeting set up um, sometime in May or June to work on the code rewrites, and we'll include that one. Well, and, and so if we uh, decided we were going to have APD investigate that, they'd have to do some training of officers or or something, I would imagine, so they'd be know what procedure to follow. So. Right. All right. Any any other comments or questions about challenges or allegations of fraud? All right. Any, anything else before we move on to reports of the State of Alaska Division of Elections? All right. Let's move on down to C then on our agenda. Do you have any information for us, Ms. Jones? Well, we we do have um, the number is about um, there are 43,000 people who are going to be classified as undeliverable in the voter registration database. Um, you know, 22,000 that you didn't you authorized us to not mail ballots to, and the other 22,000 are in those cages back there. And we've given that information to the state, so the state should be updating the voter registration roll. And um, I think the good thing is, is the significant savings to us in the next election. However, it goes to number two, 
the voter rolls are obviously problematic. So I'm glad Carolyn is here because she and I have talked about, you know, I think the next step, we did a, we did a good job on teaching people how to vote by mail, but we may not have done quite as good of a job in educating people that it's their responsibility to update their information in the voter registration rolls. And so Carolyn and I have talked about working on that in the next, um, before the next election. Did you have anything you wanted to add about that, Carolyn? So, so by, by not um, changing their new address when they move, uh, they're sort of eliminating themselves from uh, the eligibility to vote. Well, Mr. Chair, I think we have a we have a, another issue that probably should be referred to the legislative committee. If you fill out a national change of address form, and I'm not positive I understand this 100%, but you can mark on it to notify the division of elections or the state division of elections. And in Alaska, it doesn't matter because you didn't sign the form. So Alaska ignores that. I think that's a problem. Mm. I think that, and the state law uh, allows that. I think we need to work on this legislation that most likely will be before the state legislature in January. And it needs to say, if someone files a national change of address form and says to notify the state division of elections, state has to contact these people and say, did you really want to cancel or change your registration? Because we got lots of calls from people, livid would be an understatement, because they attempted to change their address and there's nothing on that form that says, oh, by the way, this won't work for the state of Alaska. Huh. Wow. And so we created sort of a catch-22? That's a good way to look at it. Well, Mr. Dunbar? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Peterson. So and the reason it's so exacerbated in our case is that those same people would show up to their polling place, right, be told in person, oh, you're still registered there, and they'd be like, oh, dang it. All right, I fill out a question, question ballot, and here you go, and too bad. In our case, they likely didn't receive a ballot packet, and so they feel like they've been excluded, and then they have to go to a accessible vote center, presumably, which is a little bit more inconvenient in most cases than a polling place. Um, and for many of them, they probably don't realize until it's fairly late in the game this has happened. So, so it's, it's, the, it's a problem over the state of Alaska, but, it, but in our voters' minds, it's been exacerbated by vote by mail. Exactly. Yep. Well, this sort of brought this whole situation, uh, you know, to a head, and so the state I mean, they, it's, it's their files. They, they, they should be trying to keep them as accurate as possible. And so we've just, um, we, you know, in, through our vote-by-mail process, have just sort of shown uh, the weakness of their system in areas where it needs improvement. So for my colleagues on the legislative committee, when we go to talk to the state legislature about this, and I, I do think this is, this is we should do so, and, and with Ms. Jones's help, um, Alaska must be in the minority of states that does it this way, right? Because otherwise, the USPS would say wouldn't have that option, or would say something like, "Check this if you want to inform your uh, Department of Elections," but none of them will accept it. <laughs> right, yeah, or they would have a signature. We, we must be in a relatively small minority of states for the post office is being completely irrational. And as much as people dislike the post office, I think they would know a little bit better than that. So. Okay. Why isn't that, sure. Mr. Yeah. Why isn't that fixed by PFD voter? That is, why doesn't it get caught? That, you, you fill this out, but they also presumably are filing for the PFD at the right new address. Um, through the chair, Mr. Prop, that is unclear right now. So the voters whose PFD addresses were corrected this year were only voters who registered for the PFD from March 1st to March 30th of 2017. 
those are the only people whose addresses were corrected in time for this election. So the state's a little behind. Because of the effective date of the PFD voter and their delay in getting it done? Exactly. Okay. So now we did have people who voted in this election who said, I registered with PFD in January. Well, they were not registered to vote because there's a 30-day waiting period and all kinds of stuff that the state has. So that is another part of our voter outreach and education that we need to do is if you register for the PFD in January of 2019 and say you want to register to vote, that does not register you to vote in time for the Muni election. The PFD voter was designed for the November election to so really, yeah, that's just their schedule and couldn't adequately adequately address the April election too. So Mr. Croft, the other part of your question regarding addresses is slightly more problematic. And so uh, although um, I, I have two understandings, one is that PFD voter info, address info is not great is what I've been told. It's not perfect. The presumption was that was going to be the best ones around, right? Because they'd always want to get the check. Right. Well, the they answer to policy. that is that um, to get your check, your bank routing information yes. needs to be correct, but your address mm -hmm. does not. It's true. Although banks want to make sure that it's similar, they're not quite as concerned as with apartment number, east or west, north or south, which are the problems that we're having with addresses. Or, you know, Girdwood, lot one, block two, I don't think your bank cares about that, but we can't mail a ballot to that person. Right. So I think we're going to get closer, and I think that we need to educate people, and we need to work with PFD, and the state needs to work with PFD that says, tells people, check your address on your PFD, make sure it's correct. So we'll get, it's going to keep getting better, but it's not there yet. And the. Mr. Croft. There's 40,000 sitting in the undeliverable lockbox file? 43. 43. The, the total of Anchorage voters with a condition code of undeliverable will be about 43,000. And is that this direct address does not exist or they aren't there anymore? A combination of both. Do you have any idea which is more? Definitely. Um, they are not at this address anymore. We know that the address doesn't exist is like about a hundred, no, 1,300. So very small. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Croft. Any other questions about uh, undeliverables or the state's system of voter registration or how we might be able to approve that? Mr. One Owens. more comment, Mr. Chair, and that's that our education campaign is going to remind voters, although the state maintains the system, you know, the state's position is that it's really up to the voter to update their voter registration and make sure their address is correct. Um, I think we need to help the state make that easier for voters, and that's the national change of address. But it's still the voters' responsibility. So we so we're going to have to do some additional education, uh, not only the state of Alaska but the the voters in Anchorage. Mm -hmm. That's not as easy as it sounds, because um, we we find out that people communicate in so many different ways. Uh, in the modern America than they did in the old days. You know, so we have to do numerous types of outreach to try to find people so that, so that they can't say, nobody told me. <laughs> well, I will tell you, Mr. Chair, one of Carolyn's um, goals in her um, outreach and education campaign was to inform every voter what they needed to know about the April 3rd, 2018 by mail election. And I will tell you, I think I may have had one call from a voter a week after the election that said I didn't know about the election. <laughs> and that is really remarkable. And I think it shows that our outreach and education campaign was truly a success. 
Yes, you know, I actually expected people to be calling me from their polling locations that day saying, oh, did you move my poll? I, I'm here to vote. Where are they? But not a single phone call uh, to tell me that or ask me where do they vote nowadays. So our, our outreach and education was, was well done, I, I think. And in a couple of the community council meetings that I attended that you were there, people were asking you very difficult leading questions and the fact that you were able to answer those questions in a professional and uh, calm manner was was to me fairly amazing so uh, kudos to you for the job that you did in outreach and education Carol thank you M Mr. Dunbar did you have something additional no thank you all right well we're uh, we still have about 10 minutes left anything else we want to discuss um, here today you can yeah please pass those cookies around mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have is there any old business that we didn't manage to get on the agenda today all right great well I guess we'll go to audience participation My name is Eugene Carl Haber, I live in the Massachusetts Valley. Follow all the process, all the process kind of stuff made by the governing body. More like the public message. I had not planned to speak here today, but I couldn't help but begin this remaining motion number two introduction. Uh, normally you see a roll call who is present at the meeting or at the committee. And then uh, the bureau does something really cool at these different meet, uh, boards and commissions generally. It's called audi audience introduction. And that provides people to be identified at the beginning of the meeting who they are. Uh, I note that in the beginning of the meeting, you have the word introduction, but it doesn't say it's the audience. But you pretty much identified everyone in the room except for me. Um, the last part I'm making, being very brief here, is the not just the idea of the reasonable opportunity for public to be heard, but everyone needs to be able to hear each other and what they're saying. Okay? And I've had a very difficult time hearing on occasion certain parties speaking here sometimes it's too soft but but I think one key reason to it is it's been the problem is you're holding the meetings in this building and sometimes the meetings these meetings have been held in the middle of the election and you've got a lot of workers and all that here you've held it in other rooms before and it, as far as noise effect it was more uh, effective to be meeting there than here because the end result is it's difficult to hear and um and the key thing is you, we all need to hear each other with respect, but if we can't hear what their people or parties are saying, then what's the point of having a meeting? And that was my comment, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I guess we'll be adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>